learned in our previous video part 1 that the male gamete is formed in the pollen grain and the female gamete in the embryo sac. However, both these gametes are non-motile. Therefore, the male and female gamete have to be brought together for fertilization to occur. This is achieved by means of pollination. Pollination is the transfer of pollen grains shed from the anther to the stigma of the pistil. Pollination is mainly divided into three types, autogamy, detonogamy and xenogamy. Autogamy, as the name suggests, pollination happens within the same flower. Pollen grains from the anther are transferred into the stigma of the same flower. For autogamy to occur, the stigma and anthers should be close to each other. In most of the flowers, the anthers and stigma are exposed. These kinds of flowers are called chasmogamous flowers. Example, hibiscus. Here you can see the anthers and stigma are exposed. In chasmogamous flowers, as the anthers and stigma are exposed, in addition to autogamy, other kinds of pollinations can also occur. Which means the stigma can receive pollen grains from a different flower of the same plant or pollen grains from another plant. Another type of flower is called cleistogamous flower which does not open at all. Example, peep flower. In those flowers, as you can see here, the anther and stigma lie close to each other as the flower is closed. There is no chance for cross-pollination in cleistogamous flowers. The pollen grains will fall on the stigma directly and pollination will happen. The main advantage of cleistogamy is that even in the absence of pollinators, pollination will happen. But as there is no chance of cross-pollination in cleistogamy, genetic variation is impossible. Gitinogamy. In this type of pollination, pollen grains from one flower will fall on the stigma of another flower from the same plant. This will happen with the help of pollinators. However, as the pollination is happening between the flowers of a same plant, there will not be any genetic variation. In xenogamy, the pollen grains from one flower will fall on the stigma of another flower from a different plant. This will happen with the help of pollinators and as the pollination is happening between the flowers from different plants, it will bring genetic variation among the offsprings. Agents of pollination. There are two types of agents help in pollination, a biotic agent and biotic agent. A biotic agent examples of wind and water, biotic agents are animals. There is a chance of wasting some amount of pollen grains during the pollination by wind and water as the pollen grains coming in contact with the stigma is a chance factor. To compensate for this wastage, the flowers produce enormous amounts of pollen grains when compared to the number of ovules available for pollination. Let's learn more about the pollination by wind. Flowers and pollen grains must have some important features for the wind to carry them along with it. Example of a wind pollinated flower is dandelion. The pollen grains should be light weighted. Pollen grains should be non-sticky. There should be exposed to stamen so that the pollen are easily dispersed into the wind currents. Large, often feathery stigma to trap the pollen grains coming through wind. Pollination by water. Pollination by water is limited to mainly monocotyledons. Monocotyledons have a single seed leaf. But water is a medium for pollination in lower plants like algae, bryophytes and pteridophytes. Plants which use water as an agent for pollination are Vallisneria and Hydrilla. In Vallisneria, the female flower has long stalk and with the help of this stalk, the flower reaches the surface of water and then pollen grains are released into the water. 
then they reach to the stigma through the water current another group of water pollinated plants are sea grasses female flowers of sea grasses remain submerged in the water and the pollen grains are released inside the water those pollen grains are long ribbon like which will aid them to be carried by water and eventually reach the stigma in most water pollinated species the pollen grains are protected from wetting by a mucilaginous covering but in most aquatic plants pollination happens with the help of insects and water as the flowers emerge above the water level the wind and water pollinated flowers are dull and do not produce nectar as the color and nectar is used to attract insects and these are the features of the insect pollinated flowers pollination by animals a lot of animals act as pollinators like bees butterflies flies wasps ants birds and larger animals like lemurs rodents and some reptiles flowers of animal pollinated plants are specifically adapted to a particular kind of animal let's see what are the features insect pollinated flowers papaya flower is an example of insect pollinated flower large colorful with a fragrance to attract insects they will be rich in nectar when the flowers are small they all cluster together into an inflorescence to make them clearly visible flowers pollinated by flies and beetles secrete a fall order to attract them when the animal pollinators come to have nectar from the flowers the sticky pollen grains will stick onto their bodies when these animals visit another flower for nectar the pollen grains get attached to their body will fall onto the stigma of that flower hence pollination will happen these pollen grains and nectar are actually rewards for the visiting animals another reward is that some flowers provide space for birds to lay eggs example amorphophallus which is the tallest flower at about 6 feet in height another plant called yucca cannot complete its life cycle without a moth the moth deposits its egg in the locule of the ovary of the flower and in turn the flower gets pollinated by the moth the larvae of the moth come out of the eggs as the seeds start developing let's learn about the outbreeding devices most of the plants produce hermaphrodite flowers that is one flower contains both the male and the female gametes in those plants autogamy is possible which will lead to inbreeding depression that means autogamy will not bring genetic variability and eventually flowers will lose their strength to overcome these problems flowering plants have many methods to discourage self pollination and encourage cross pollination let's see what are those methods pollen release and stigma receptivity are not synchronized that means sometimes the pollens get released before the stigma gets receptive or vice versa anther and stigma are placed at different positions so that self pollination won't happen self incompatibility it is the inability of a fertile seed plant to produce a zygote after self pollination by inhibiting pollen germination or pollen tube growth in the pistil production of unisexual flowers one plant will contain either male or female flowers example as in papaya these are the methods adapted by plants to prevent self pollination let's see what happens when the pollen grains fall on the stigma either with the help of pollinators or by autogamy pollination doesn't ensure the transfer of compatible pollen grains that is pollen grains from the same species as that of stigma sometimes the wrong type of pollen grains fall on the stigma wrong type means they might be different from the species of the stigma
to prevent the fertilization with the wrong pollen type the pistil has its own mechanism pistil has the ability to recognize whether the pollen is compatible or not if the pollen grain is compatible the pistil accepts that and proceeds further fertilization events but if the pollen grains are not compatible the pistil rejects the pollen by preventing pollen germination in stigma or pollen tube growth in style this recognition can be achieved by the interaction between the components of the pistil and the pollen grains if the pollen grain falling on the stigma is compatible the pistil accepts it which will lead to the germination of the pollen grain on the stigma as a result a pollen tube is produced through one of the germ pores the pollen tube continues its growth through the tissues of the stigma and style and reaches the ovary the contents of the pollen grain move into the pollen tube In our previous video we have discussed that most of the pollen grains are shed in its two celled stage that is the generative cell and the vegetative cell in them the generative cell divides and forms two male gametes the generative cell divides and forms two male gametes during the growth of the pollen tube in the stigma other pollen grains which are shed at three celled stage have already two male gametes the pollen tube then reaches the ovary and enters the ovule through the micropyle and then enters one of the synergids present at the micropylar end through the filiform apparatus this filiform apparatus actually guides the pollen tube entry The events from the deposition of the pollen grains until the entry of pollen tube into the ovary is known as pollen pistil interaction. We now saw that the pollen tube enters one of the synergids in the micropylar end through the filiform apparatus. Then the pollen tube releases two male gametes into the cytoplasm of the synergid. these two male gametes are released into the cytoplasm of the synergid one of the two male gametes now move towards the egg cell and fuses with it completing the syngamy syngamy is nothing but the fusion of two cells or nuclei as a result of the syngamy a zygote is formed the other male gamete which is in the cytoplasm of the synergid now move towards the polar nuclei situated in the center and fuses with them to form a triploid primary endosperm nucleus this formation of primary endosperm nucleus involves the fusion of three haploid nuclei and hence it can be called as a triple fusion now we saw two fusion one between the male gamete and the egg cell that is a syngamy and between the male gamete and polar nuclei that is the triple fusion hence two fusions happened in the embryo sac and it is called double fertilization the primary endosperm nucleus develops into the endosperm this is the primary endosperm nucleus it develops into the endosperm and zygote develops into the embryo the endosperm plays an important role in supporting the growth of embryo by supplying nutrients and it protects the embryo as well let's learn about the events that happen after double fertilization as we discussed earlier endosperm supports the embryo growth by providing nutrients so endosperm develops before the development of the embryo There are mainly three types of endosperm development: nuclear, cellular, and helobial. Nuclear endosperm is the most common type of endosperm formation. The primary endosperm nucleus undergoes mitotic division without cytoplasmic division. As a result, numerous free nuclei are formed. Here you can see this is the primary endosperm nucleus. this will undergo mitotic division and forms numerous free nuclei this mitotic division happens 
without the cytoplasmic division. So these free nuclei are formed. Subsequently, cell wall formation happens from the periphery like this. Cell wall formation happens from the periphery but there will be free nuclei in the center. The number of free nuclei formed before cellularization vary greatly. For example, in tender coconut, we can see the coconut milk inside. It is actually thousands of free nuclei. Then further development and cellularization leads to the decrease in the amount of liquid and then form surrounding white solid kernel which is the endosperm. Cellular endosperm, nuclear division is immediately followed by cytoplasmic division. In this kind of division, nuclear division is followed by cytoplasmic division but half of the cells undergo cellular mode of development and the other half in free nuclei stage. Let's see here, this is the primary endosperm nucleus which undergoes mitotic division and form half of the cells like cellular mode of development. Half will be like cells and the other half will be free nuclei. Like this. This is the helobial endosperm. Helobial endosperm is found in monocotyledons. In peas, groundnuts and beans, the endosperm is completely consumed by the embryo before seed maturation. But in castor and coconut, endosperm will persist in the mature seed. Let's learn about the embryo. We know that the ovule develops into seed and ovary into the embryo. Embryo develops at the micropylar end of the embryo sac. Before the development of the embryo, the antipodal cells and the synergids degenerate. The development of the embryo is known as embryogeny. Embryogeny starts only after a certain amount of endosperm is formed. This is because the embryo needs endosperm to provide nourishment. First, the zygote is divided into two cells, suspensor cell and embryo cell. Suspensor cell is found at the basal side, that is the micropylar site. And the embryo cell is situated at the chalazal end. Embryo cell is smaller compared to the suspensor cell. This basal cell undergoes many divisions and forms 4 to 8 cells. These suspensor cell after division push the embryo cell towards the endosperm so that it can derive nourishment. First, the basal cell undergoes division and forms 4 to 8 cells. These suspensor cells push the embryo towards the endosperm to derive nourishment. And this embryo cell then undergoes division and forms a group of cells. At this stage, the embryo cell is called the pro-embryo. Here you can see. This forms 4 to 8 cells and this is the embryo cell. It undergoes many divisions and form a group of cells. This pro-embryo develops into the globular embryo when the embryo is spherical or globular, heart shaped embryo and torpedo shaped embryo. Finally, the embryo becomes mature. The suspensor complex is shortened and there will be space for the mature embryo. Let's see the structure of embryo in dicots. In dicots, the embryo consists of one embryonal axis and two cotyledons. The portion of the embryonal axis above the level of cotyledons, this is called the epicotyle. This region is epicotyle and it terminates with the plumule or the stem tip. The cylindrical portion below the cotyledons is called the hypocotyle and it terminates at its lower end called the radical or the root tip. Covering the root tip there is a root cap. Here there will be root cap. 
whereas the embryo in monocotyledons possesses only one cotyledon in grass family the one cotyledon is called the scutellum at the lower end of the embryonal axis there is a radical and root cap as in dicot the fertilized ovule develops into seed it is the final product of the sexual reproduction seed consists of seed coat cotyledon and embryonal axis the cotyledons are the food reserve once the endosperm is completely used up by the embryo due to the presence of stored food the cotyledons are thick and swollen we learned in the previous video that each ovule has one to two protective envelopes called the integuments they harden and become the seed coat the micropyle remains as a small pore in the seed coat through which oxygen and water can enter during the seed germination as the seed matures we all know its water content gets reduced and the metabolic activities also slow down now the seed enters into a state of dormancy if the conditions are favorable the seeds germinate the wall of the ovary develops into the wall of the fruit called the pericarp the number of seeds present in a fruit is equal to the number of ovules present in the ovary as the ovules are transforming into seeds based on the presence of endosperm in seed we can divide seeds into two non albuminous and ex albuminous seeds in non albuminous seeds no residual endosperm is present as it is completely used by embryo example in pea and groundnut in ex albuminous seeds a certain part of endosperm is still present in the seed as we already saw coconut is an example of ex albuminous seeds and another is castor in some seeds such as black pepper the remnants of nucellus is also present nucellus is the mass of cells in the ovule such persistent nucellus is the perisperm fruits can be divided mainly into three types false fruit true fruit and parthenocarpic fruit in false fruit some flower parts do not degenerate and contribute towards the fruit formation example in apple and strawberry the thalamus contributes to the fruit formation true fruits develop from the ovary all the floral parts degenerate and fall off example cherries and plums parthenocarpic fruits develop without fertilization parthenocarpy can be induced through the application of growth hormones they are seedless fruits example banana now let's learn about the advantages of seeds seeds have better adaptive strategies for dispersal to new habitats and it helps the species to colonize in other parts as well strategies like some seeds have hooks on them to attach to animals fur or our clothes some can float in water when the seeds are light they can be easily carried away by the wind they have sufficient food reserves until they are capable of photosynthesis the seed coat gives protection to the seeds during unfavorable conditions when the seeds are formed as a result of cross pollination the species will have new genetic variations seeds are the basis of agriculture these are the advantages of seeds plant breeders cross different species to produce commercially superior varieties one of the methods to achieve this is through artificial hybridization during crossing it is very important to ensure that only the desired pollen grains fall on the stigma steps should be taken to avoid the contamination of stigma with other pollen grains let's see what are the methods taken during artificial hybridization mainly two methods are taken during artificial hybridization that is emasculation and bagging 
If the plant has bisexual flowers, it is necessary to remove the anthers before dehiscence. Otherwise, autogamy might happen. The removal of anthers can be done with the help of forceps. This method of removing anthers from flower bud is called emasculation. Even though the anthers are removed, there is still a possibility that pollen grains from other flower could fall on the stigma. To avoid this, the emasculated flowers have to be covered with a bag made up of butter paper. This process is known as bagging. When the stigma of the bagged flower attains receptivity, mature pollen grains collected from the desired flower can be dusted on the stigma. After this, the flowers can be rebagged and the fruits are allowed to develop. During artificial hybridization, only the desired pollen grains are introduced into the stigma. As a result, there will be no pollen rejection. If the plant has only unisexual flowers, autogamy will not happen and there is no need for emasculation. Bagging is done before the flowers are opened and the rest of the procedures are same. That's it about the chapter sexual reproduction in flowering plants. If you like this video, please share it with your friends. If you have any queries, put it in the comment box. Thank you.